happy to see everyone here. And uh, we are going to talk about family office and angel money. Um, and I will be moderating and we'll get some very insightful comments uh, from the two panelists. And also, if anyone has questions at the end, we'll, we'll open it up. But first, uh, let me just introduce myself. My name is Irfan Latif. I am an IP attorney at Kenobi Martins, which is here in Orange County. Um, I see a lot of slides that have one uh, slide dedicated to IP. And uh, if you ever had questions about what do those slides really mean, please let me, <laughs> me know and I'll let you in on um, the salient aspects of those slides. Um, first, let me have Omid Avakian, Avakian? Akavan. Akavan. Yeah, that's right. Introduce him, himself. Uh, he was, um, he's the managing director of Artho Ventures, Anthro Ventures, a family office. He has uh, degrees in biomedical engineering, and interestingly, he was a Fulbright, Fulbright fellow as well. Thanks. Anything you'd like to add? Uh, um, no, I mean, we'll, we'll start with that. And sure. And then next to him, we have Dr. Gary Gershoni, general partner, Bay Med Ventures Partners, and also Life Sciences Angel. Um, he became a doctor, interestingly, at age 23, which I found uh, interesting, and uh, continues to succeed in his other ventures post uh, uh, med school. So let's uh, jump right into it, and uh, maybe we could start with Omid. Uh, can you provide a quick background of yourself and an overview of the groups or funds that you are representing? Sure, happy to. Um, so, uh, as Erfan mentioned, background in bioengineering. Um, started my early career in management consulting. Did a lot of work, uh, both with Fortune 500 companies uh, and also venture-backed startups. Looking at everything from growth strategy to M&A to pricing to product launch. Um, then transitioned into industry, uh, where I led strategy and business development. Uh, at Beckton Dickinson Diagnostics, um, looked across the portfolio, microbiology to sample prep to point of care diagnostics, um, then moved into uh, venture. Uh, I was at MVM Partners um, out of Boston. Um, and you know, one of the things that I saw was happening in the industry is funds were getting bigger, they were going later stage, really targeting growth equity, um, and so even MVM, you know, raised fund five um, and to really focus on the middle market. And most funds that had been doing med tech either went out of business, focused on biotech or grew to be really large and therefore had to move up the food chain. And so I saw an opportunity to really focus on companies that needed that interim capital, you know, late stage clinical to early commercial, um, needed a flexible capital structure. And so I started Anthro Ventures um, with our family office and a series of other family offices focused on healthcare investing, um, subsector agnostic, do everything from med tech to health tech to healthcare services. Um, and, you know, so that's a bit about us. Gary, can you also comment on great, your Great, great. So uh, I'm Gary Gershoni. I'm an interventional cardiologist by training and I've actually uh, been that for 25 plus years. Uh, and concomitant with that, I've been a serial med tech entrepreneur. Uh, so founded two medical device companies, both in the cardiovascular space, Vascular Solutions and Angioscore, both with successful exits. And the last few years really turned my attention to uh, early stage investing in medical devices, digital health. Uh, initially through uh, involvement uh, in the angel investing community. So I'm a member of two uh, relatively well-known organized angel groups in the Bay Area where I, where I live, Life Science Angels and the Band of Angels, and I'm wearing that hat today. But in the uh, last year, right in the midst of COVID, along with my partner, we are raising a, um, a dedicated venture fund uh, later uh, than, than uh, typical angel investing. So call it uh, Series B-ish, medical device, digital health, focused geographically in North America and Israel, which we think is uh, an amazing ecosystem in terms of innovation right now. And of course, uh, uh, send uh, our best wishes to what's going on there right now. There's a lot of turmoil in the area, uh, but uh, I will be wearing my angel investor hat today for the purposes of this, uh, of this uh, panel. Now, you uh, mentioned cardiovascular, is that the only um, med tech healthcare area you look into for investing or are there other areas that interest you? 
So we are completely, both as an angel investor as well as a venture investor, uh, completely agnostic to the clinical space. Uh, as long as it meets the investment criteria that we're looking for, uh, d really don't care about that and really don't care about the regulatory path. Equally comfortable and interested in more complicated regulatory pathways, whether it's a PMA, 510K, or otherwise. Um, and having been an observer of the space for so many years, very happy to see how things have evolved in the last few years. And I think, to a large extent, a much more accommodating regulatory agency than we had 10 years ago, which I think is an important catalyst for uh, the uh, uh, increased enthusiasm we're seeing from medical device investing now, along with uh, other developments. So I mean, how about yourself? What uh, areas do you concentrate on in, in the health space? So similar, um, subsector agnostic, uh, always looking for innovation, whether it's uh, technology innovation, business model innovation, um, and you know, look at everything, you know, orthopedics, cardiovascular, diagnostics, um, you know, uh, psychiatric health. Uh, and so, you know, open, very open-minded. Um, what we typically look for in companies is, um, you know, a little bit of maturity. So um, similar to Gary, you know, don't go in and do, you know, uh, very early investing, try to find kind of a series B ish or, um, you know, companies where maybe there's been um, a challenge with the existing investors, they're tapped out, um, or, you know, they're not enthusiastic about the technology anymore. Uh, and then try and go in and really both invest with capital, but also with time um, and help these companies reposition themselves, think through their strategy uh, and find ways to grow. And then kind of be that bridge to maybe the next round of venture capital, um, you know, by, I would say, cleaning up the story or, you know, improving the story. So, so going on with that, um, in, in your evaluation of companies to invest in, uh, what resources do you um, use, especially if you're, you know, agnostic as to space, uh, making sure that you get the right diligence done on spaces that you may not be familiar with? So I think it really depends on how the deal comes in. Uh, if it's um, you know, a company that's been introduced by another fund where maybe they've looked at it, maybe they're investors, um, often you can rely on some of the work that they've done uh, and piggyback on their diligence, and then really focus on what the key risks are, key issues are. Um, if it comes in through another family office, it's kind of you know, from start to finish, soup to nuts, you know, help me understand the market. Let me understand how you're thinking about the technology and how do you position it. Let's talk about reimbursement. Um, and then obviously at the end, look through the IP um, and you know, bring in external consultants. Um, if it's you know, cardiovascular device, go find you know, the leading three to five KOLs in that space. Um, often companies will come with some of that uh, to start. So you'll, you'll first talk to their KOLs which you can always assume have some bias, and it's it's a good it's it's always good to hear the positive bias, and then you know go and talk to some independents to really get their perspective, and then try and come to some you know semblance of truth, uh, and then really narrow down what the key risks are and what what the value inflection points are for that deal. So Gary, is your process somewhat similar? Uh, probably a little bit different, and and I'll, I'll speak mainly to the angel aspect of it. So. There are both advantages and or disadvantages and nuances to the way in which angels invest and try to fill a role uh, in, the, um, in the requirements of early stage companies. So for certain angel groups, and I'll specifically say point to life science angels, one of the big advantages is that we have members that span acro across all the areas of expertise. Uh, that would be helpful in terms of doing due diligence. So we do our own internal thorough due diligence because we can call on uh, technical people, engineers. We have uh, folks that have been uh, 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 mechanical engineers at some of the largest corporate strategics and startups. We have IP attorneys. Uh, we have clinicians. And uh, we have uh, individuals who have been operators in, in prior startups. And so it's really about uh, encouraging that kind of collaboration. And within the group, we have the expertise to do most of the due diligence that's required and don't need to farm it out. That's the good news. The challenging news is that it is obviously within the setting of an angel group, um, unpaid work 
and it's, we're bartering. So if I provide some of my expertise, my, my expectation is my colleagues will do the same in, in reverse. And uh, sometimes there are challenges in coordinating all of that. Uh, similarly, the decision-making process uh, in terms of investing is, a, is by committee, if you will. Oh and we know that sometimes committees can work well and sometimes they can be challenging. So those are some of the nuances that I think are unique to organized angel groups. But in the end, I think they fulfill an extremely important role that has not been met by the traditional venture community. And for mostly companies that are beyond the very earliest seed funding that may be friends and family, uh, that may be even governmental grants, SBIR and others, uh, and there is that, win, that, that gap that I think they, they have been very successful in, in helping to bridge. So you mentioned uh, decision by committee. Um, it seems to me that would be very challenging given, given what you explained about your uh, organization. Is it, uh, have you had an instance where you really thought an investment was, was a good choice, but the, the committee went against you and you weren't able to really convince them <laughs> to go along with you? Well, I use the, I, I use the term committee euphemistically. It's really um, decision by persuasion. And uh, uh, in most angel groups, and the structures are different, everybody writes their own check. And I think the better model is that those checks are all uh, amalgamated uh, into a special vehicle, if you will, uh, and then once, so the cap table for a small company doesn't become inundated with sure. very small investors. So what I meant by um, uh, decision by committee, it's really the ability of a lead to be designated that is enthusiastic about the uh, prospects of a given company and to have the ability to persuade uh, one's colleagues within the group uh, to number one, write more checks, if you will, uh, because each one typically has their own um, uh, decision-making authority, and to uh, maximize what each person will write. Now, there are angel groups that also have so-called sidecar funds where commitments are made, and they tend to function more like very, very early seed or early stage uh, VC funds. Uh, they're not the norm, but they certainly exist. And of course, that uh, would occur a little differently and more with a smaller group of individuals involved with the decision making. Great. Um, maybe you can comment on the decision making process for you. Yeah. So um, you know, it, it's it's somewhat similar, although it's a um, very limited subset of decision makers. So um, you know, I usually will do all the work, do the diligence, write the memo. Um, you know, our family will invest. And then the question is, you know, what will other families do? Um, and you know, for the most part, I would say nine out of ten deals. If I've done the work and we're putting money behind it, uh, the other families will follow. But sometimes, you know, and this is, I think, um, true to all family offices, is that you know the checkbook is open when you know there's cash available or sitting on the sidelines, or there's a liquidity event, or the markets are doing well. Um, and then there are times where Either the family is busy with, you know, either personal issues or their core business, and so I think one of the, one of the challenges I would say that exists in um, operating and raising money from family offices is that, you know, when you see a family office and you understand a family office, that applies to that family office. It's not generally applicable, and like unlike you know professional funds and investors where that is their full-time job and you know, they're compensated for it. Family offices are typically looking to invest because they like a space, um, you know, they, they like the person, they've been introduced to the company by somebody they know, um, and so there's some kind of a connection to the investment um, or you know, to the disease state. And I think one of, the, one of the challenges about raising from family offices, good and bad, is that family offices can become very enthusiastic uh, about a deal um, but just as easily, they can be distracted by a hundred other things, it's, whether it's their real estate portfolio or their operating business. And so trying to garner that attention and get them to come in and commit is, you know, takes time. And so I would say the, the one downside of being a loosely structured um, investor is that you can upsize or downsize to the company's needs, but sometimes it takes longer to get a deal done than it would with a fund. And that's, mm. that's just the nature of... Um, you know, investing with family offices. 
So you mentioned that oftentimes a deal will come through an introduction uh, from someone or interest in a, in, a, in a disease state or something like that. Uh, do you also get um, you know, other kind of unsolicited um, you know, funding requests? And or what is the type that you generally uh, feel more comfortable with when an investment comes in? Yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, I think with, with any investor, if you have a warm, you know, and this is kind of, as I think, putting myself in an entrepreneur's shoes, having a warm introduction to an investor is always helpful because, you know, your email doesn't get lost in the inbox. You know, I mean, I, like many other investors, probably get a few hundred emails a day where, you know, companies are looking for money or it's a banker, you know, shopping a deal. And usually the ones that bubble to the top are the ones that come in either through someone you know, and so there's a warm introduction, or at conferences like this, where you're actually, you know, meeting people and you know engaging with them and hearing about their story, um, and then you know setting up time to really go through the deck and understand um, you know the technology and the opportunity. And so it's you know if if you try once you know via email, try again. You know if you don't get via email, try via LinkedIn or find you know mutual connections because it's it's never that you know. You know, we're trying to ignore um, an opportunity. It's just you know, you only have 24 hours in a day, and you know, you look at deals for 18 hours a day, and you're managing a portfolio, and you know, um, you know, looking and doing diligence and new opportunities. And so, it's it's also a matter of timing, right? And where where do you catch the you know family office or the angels or you know whatever um, to be able to garner you know their attention and really get um, that one on one time. And I'll add to that. I think it's very important to the uh, founders, entrepreneurs here, is it, whether it's investing in a family office or with angel groups, this warm introduction, however you want to define it, is extremely important. So in general, I will say with the angel groups I'm involved with, unless there is a member that has had some contact uh, with the company, the likelihood of getting funded is almost zero. So it really behooves one to make the effort, try to find those degrees of freedom, if you will, to make contact uh, with members of the group so that the application is, isn't a cold application that doesn't have anyone who's a champion for it. And that applies, of course, regardless if you're going to a traditional venture group. But I can't emphasize enough how important that warm introdu introduction is. Great point. So no, <laughs> no one cold email either of you. Uh, maybe try to find you after this uh, session. Well, we we are all inundated. <laughs> one of the one of the, when I started doing this a few years ago, I initially thought, "Wow, I'm a really popular person." You know, <laughs> everybody likes me. <laughs> As an investor, what you have to understand is once your name or once your entity gets out there, you become inundated. And it's not the job of founders or entrepreneurs to really worry about our mental health. But we are literally inundated with requests from virtually every possible venue. And so that's, this is really why I'm trying to emphasize the point. If you want to stand out, if you really do want to make a connection with a particular, particular individual, venture fund, angel group, do the work, lay the pipe, get that introduction. And I think that will really be very helpful. Now, one thing you mentioned earlier uh, was uh, investment opportunities in the US and Israel. Are there other? areas uh, internationally that you are, have interest in? So I think you know, the, the, the world now has become an amazing place for innovation, COVID notwithstanding, and also catalyzed, of course, by, by COVID. And it's bandwidth for us, and it's deal flow for us. So it turns out, for a variety of reasons, uh, and I'm not wearing my angel hat now, I'm wearing my personal hat, my fund hat. Um, over the 25 plus years that I've been involved in the med tech industry, my deal flow and our deal flow primarily is North American and Israel. There's a lot of uh, terrific innovation now uh, in, in Europe. A lot of the early stuff has been catalyzed by the EU, Horizon 2020 Fund, which is uh, to some extent their equivalent, uh, SBIR, has done a, a lot to really encourage innovation there. Of course, Asia is tremendous, whether it's China, other, um, uh, ecosystems. So one really has to find where the match is. For us, it happens to be those geographies, obviously the US uh, for us, and we're based in the Bay Area. 
Israel, you know, pound for pound, we think is one of the best ecosystems right now for medical devices and digital health. Uh, they've had terrific exits. Uh, it's an amazingly interconnected uh, ecosystem uh, and some great innovation. So uh, that's really, from our perspective, the reasons we focus on these areas. Great. Amit, how about yourself? Yeah, I, so, I mean, I, I definitely look at deals everywhere. Um, you know, having been at MVM, we we're a cross-border fund, looked at European deals, looked at U.S. deals. And so um, I think good innovation comes from anywhere. Um, you know, the question becomes, who is the syndicate um, involved? And so if we're taking more of a lead role, I think it's hard to invest in a company that's outside the U.S., especially given the pandemic and everything else. Um, but, you know, we have, you know, so we've, we've invested in a company out of Singapore. Um, and, you know, there's some benefits to that because you get R&D tax credits and, you know, government support. And so there are other reasons to invest in, you know, companies outside the U.S., but I would say predominantly um, US-based. I think you know, one of the other theses that we have is that there are under-ventured ecosystems that exist, um, whether it's St. Louis or Baltimore or Ohio or you know, um, RTP um, and even Florida and Texas. So I think there, there are other places beyond the Bay Area and Boston um, where actually there's re you know, really good entrepreneurs, really good medical systems, um, and you know, there's also, I think, good value because the cost of living is an expense. You're not paying 50 grand a month for lab space, right? You're paying yeah. five grand a month for lab space. And so also your dollars go further. Um, and I think that's, you know, I, I personally, as an investment thesis, like companies that are very capital efficient and they find ways to you know, rub two pennies and make a dollar. And I think that's um, and and that's a bit of the ingenuity that I think goes into entrepreneurship and being scrappy and staying scrappy. And you know, it's in some ways it's very incongruent with the VC model because as as a venture capital fund, you have a couple hundred million dollars. You have to deploy X amount of dollars into each deal, and therefore, in many cases, you're trying to jam more money in than the companies need or can consume. And so you start to waste a lot of capital. Um, to get to the same endpoint, and you know that's where I think family offices and angels provide an alternative source of capital. At least till you get to a value inflection point, and at some point you either do a deal with a strategic or a VC fund to go raise you know ten or twenty million bucks to run your pivotal study or to raise your growth round. Uh, Gary, on that same point, since you are in the Bay Area, do you look outside of the Bay Area and what areas within North America? Do you find interesting? Of course, the, you know, the demise of the Bay Area has been oft predicted, but uh, <laughs> always wrong. And I have friends and colleagues who this time around decided they're leaving for a variety of reasons, <laughs> tax reasons and many other ones. Uh, but yes, we definitely look outside of the Bay Area. There's terrific, and I completely agree with Omid, there's terrific areas of innovation outside of the Bay Area, outside of California. And I think uh, being able to identify those uh, uh, locations, uh, entrepreneurs, is very important. Um, we take an active investment role. So whether it's uh, as an angel or whether it's uh, uh, from a venture uh, funding uh, perspective. And I think that entrepreneurs and founders need to decide what type of investors they want as well, if they have the luxury of making that decision. And do they want active investors? That's not to say to be micromanagers, but really to be there uh, as champions uh, to uh, help uh, expand networks, to provide advice. Uh, and uh, that's certainly how we feel. And, uh, and so to some extent, that uh, is reflected in the geographies that we're willing to, uh, to be involved with. Because if, if we are active and we want to return to face-to-face -face meetings or uh, uh, have some type of uh, 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 involvement in that respect, I think that to some extent will also dictate where a particular uh, angel group or venture fund might want to invest. And I think that founders, entrepreneurs need to understand that uh, when they're deciding who they want to work with. So when you talk about active uh, involvement, are you talking uh, about board positions or actively managing maybe individuals uh, at the startup? I'm not sure I could dissociate the two, but in <laughs> any, of, in any of, yes, it's mainly at the board level. Okay. But you know, there are different ways in which board members participate. And having been an entrepreneur, I certainly experienced different board involvement from investors. Uh, often, 
they are also passive roles depending on the capability of the board members, whether they really have operating experience, whether they are truly value added, or whether they merely uh, have been given the board seat based on the size of the investment that was made. I think if founders can and entrepreneurs can, they should really try to focus on investors that bring value add beyond the capital that's being invested. It's not always possible, but if they can, I think that's, that's, a, that's a double advantage for sure. Meet, how about yourself? How active do you get involved with the investment? So I think it, it, it depends. So um, in some cases, very involved. I mean, you know, uh, literally doing slides for my portfolio companies mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, doing business reviews, looking at the data, um, spending time in the lab. Um, in other cases, just at the board level um, and, you know, being helpful. So if it's, you are know, trying to think through, um, you know, structuring a deal with a customer, for example, um, and a contract, you know, have a call with the sales team. Um, or if it's thinking through, you know, study design, you know, sitting in on, um, you know, KOL panel discussions. And so I think it, it depends. I always like to take the lead from you know my CEOs um, and be as involved as they want me to be, and also leave them alone um, because I think you know sometimes boards can become um, you know overbearing and uh, I don't know I've I've seen so many dysfunctional boards uh, where you know you everyone has a competing interest, different interests. Half the time you know they don't care. It was. It was the other guy's deal, and now they took the board seat because that guy left the fund, and so they're you know dispassionate um, about the investments. And so you know I try you know everything we do, we make sure that we're passionate about and we're behind um, strategically, and then it's really just following um, the entrepreneur's lead. Great, um, Gary. Can you tell me a little bit about the metrics you use to measure or track uh, your performance? Our performance or the Sorry. performance of our portfolio companies? The performance of your portfolio companies. Right. Uh, so uh, the standard measures that, that one generally uh, tracks. I think that you know, we've all, it's, it's challenging because with most of our companies that are early stage, the uh, financial metrics are assumed uh, metrics that we all know are subject to interpretation. So whether it's marketing to market or what have you. So I'm going to leave that aside because that, that deserves a conversation all unto itself. Uh, but the more important metrics, I think, for early stage companies are how are they tracking to milestones that are generally negotiated between key investors and the senior management team? Uh, are they tracking to them? Are they exceeding them? Uh, Time, I think, is perhaps the most valuable commodity for an early stage company. So to some extent, it's not just a matter of are they achieving the milestone that they set out to achieve within the uh, funding that they agreed to, but are they doing it on time? And I think that uh, being late recurrently despite achieving them is a big problem and it needs to be addressed. Uh, it may be that the milestones were not realistic, that understanding of the regulatory paths, for example, might not have been well understood. But I think having those kind of frank conversations and uh, uh, designing those very thoughtfully and carefully with the senior management team are critical because it's also an issue of confidence, confidence of the investors, the ability to then raise subsequent rounds of financing, uh, perhaps from outside investors. Uh, so I think in general terms at a high level, those are the key things that we would track. How about for you, Amid? Yeah, I think very similar, um, and I take a similar approach in investing is, you know, before, you know, through the diligence process, really try and align on what those milestones are and what, you know, the capital required is. So actually, what I try to do with a lot of portfolio companies is we say, okay, we're raising X million dollars and, you know, here's our timeline, here's our budget, and it's going to take me, you know, quarter million dollars to hit this milestone, you know, 750 grand to hit this milestone, 2 million to hit this milestone. And so, and then you kind of reflect, you know, at board meetings on a quarterly basis, hey, are we hitting these milestones? Are we on time, on budget? Um, and if we're not, it, you know, and often it's, it's not because of a lack of trying, it's because some external force, is, you know, our regulatory consultant is too busy or we can't get in the lab or something else you know, that's where you have the conversation and then try and figure out how do you risk mitigate? And is this, 
you know, a catastrophic risk or is this, you know, negligible risk that can be managed? And I, I think, you know, one advice for um, entrepreneurs is, you know, make sure that you manage your board. Um, so, you know, I think one of, boards can be very helpful in strategic decision making and helping you think through critical issues for the company and the success of the company. I think sometimes entrepreneurs forget that, you know, your, your board is kind of, you know, you could argue as your, both your management um, and your peers. And so, you know, having that relationship where, you know, you can actually call your board for help um, and also, you know, be buttoned up at a board meeting and be able to present and really talk about the issues is, is something that I think some entrepreneurs, at least younger entrepreneurs miss. And, you know, we've had in our portfolio companies, you know, growth pains around, you know, how do you engage your board and what's the right level of content and detail and not being too in the weeds, but also not being too abstract. And so, and it's, and it all depends on the company and, you know, what are you trying to do? If you're a commercial stage company, it's okay. How do we think about growth? If you're a clinical stage company, it's okay. How do we, you know, wrap up our animal studies? How do we engage with the FDA? How do we make sure that we're hitting these milestones? And I think that's important to align on what that vision is and what that strategy is before you invest um, and before you take on capital, because a lot of times the struggle is mismatch of expectations and oh well, you didn't tell me this before we did the deal or you know the you know the the fundamental premise under which you did the deal was actually not true and it's not it's not because you misled but it's because you you know omitted something yeah you know, so i think it, it's really important the diligence process is you know your chance to date your investor um, and get to know them and for them to get to know you and to really level set on you know how how you're tracking success and that's, and it's not a one size fits all model, right? Obviously financial metrics is like, don't lose money and make lots of money. You know, that, that's a given, but you know, the in between is, you know, I think where you really need to work on that before you take on the investment. And I'll add to that. I think it's a very fine line between being uh, overly involved um, micromanaging. Uh, if you're having to do that right from the beginning, then you probably didn't pick the right company and the right management team because literally they have to run the company. And your, your role there is to be more of a mentor, a champion, and to extend, nobody has all the skill sets. And so if somebody comes with a background, say as a very uh, knowledgeable biomedical engineer and is now an investor, then having that background, those networks can be very beneficial to a company, but that's not micromanaging, that's really uh, bringing added value. Uh, so I think those are those are very critical. I think that having um, having uh, some kind of a comfort from a personality standpoint, uh, these are sort of the soft parts of investing, uh, is very important. I think that there has to be early on an understanding that you get along with the senior management team, unless there is a view that you're going to make changes in the very near near term, and that's complicated. It doesn't matter when you change the senior management team and the CEO; it's always disruptive and there's a recovery that's required, and it's challenging. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that that is very important, knowing that there is this sort of comfort level that um, the uh, CEO and the senior team uh, are comfortable working with you as a board member, as a, as a key investor, and similarly that you're comfortable weighing in when it's necessary and, and, and being helpful to the company. Well, given that <clears throat> we've been in the pandemic and you're doing meetings by Zoom, uh, how have you managed that soft kind of uh, e evaluation of, uh, of companies and personalities? I, it's funny because at the beginning of this meeting, this being one of the, I think, the first meeting that I personally attend, I think most of us, of us have attended in person in about a year uh, or more. Um, I feel that I'm a little awkward with it now. I feel like, where, where is the Zoom screen to have this? Inter <laughs> you know, we've become so accustomed to the uh, way in which it's organized, and now it's 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 a, it's much less organized in terms of the interaction, and I think that is such a critically important component of both getting to know companies, getting to know the senior team, and making appropriate investment decisions. Uh, so I think you know Zoom was challenging. We know that despite um, having to do virtual meetings. Uh, uh, 
almost exclusively for the past year, uh, that that hasn't really interfered with the rapidity of investing, with the amounts of money that have been deployed. So somehow, ad as adaptive as we are as humans, we have found ways to still use this. I do think that um, in the long term, it would have been a problem. And I think now that we are seeing some return to normalcy, but I don't think it's going to go back to the old ways, as I don't think it has, for example, in the practice of medicine. None of us expect that the move towards virtual care, telemedicine, that has been catalyzed, accelerated by COVID, we're not going to go back to the way it was. The inefficiencies of those systems have been so shown to be uh, problematic during COVID. And so I think that uh, the new ways are going to be, to some extent, a hybrid of what we were doing before COVID, both for investing, the way we practice medicine, uh, and similar to what we're doing with conferences. I think a lot of people are going to say, well, I can't really physically go, but why not benefit? And so I think most of the important meetings that we want to attend in the future, um, it behooves them to create a, an effective hybrid model. And you were mentioning <clears throat> investing during the pandemic. What was one of your favorite stories or favorite uh, companies that you've invested in uh, in the past? Well, we're, we're actually about to close. Uh, and this is more of a venture investment, if you will, the other hat I wear. We're about to close on, on a deal this week. Uh, and it's all been remote because even though we now might have the opportunity of meeting the company, we're at the point where we have to close now. And it's all been virtual. And it's, it's very interesting because we have developed personal relationships with some of the key members of the team, uh, with uh, other entities related to the, uh, uh, to the investment. And even though it clearly is a different way than we would have done a year and a half ago, we would have gone, kicked the tires, visited the, uh, we are going to make the investment and convinced our LPs to invest with us uh, in this type of investment. And I think we've learned to do that. Uh, our due diligence, perhaps, in some ways, has been more thorough to compensate yeah. for the lack of interpersonal relationships. So really drilling down on all of the uh, type of information that we had accessible to us, whether it's going to the virtual data room and really going through it with a fine tooth comb, uh, doing more customer calls than we would normally have done to validate our investment thesis. Uh, so I think we compensated. Uh, to give us the added comfort by not having that in-person meeting. Yeah. How about you, Omid? So I, I've done, I guess, three deals um, over the last year. Uh, two of them were companies, you know, one of them we had a term sheet uh, signed uh, basically before COVID, so it was just a matter of closing, um, and had done a lot of diligence and, you know, been there, uh, visited facilities, spent a lot of time with the CEO, spent time with the CEO's family, um, so really got to know him on a personal level. Um, and so, you know, I think that, and, and there's really merit to that, right? Because, and, and I would say that's probably the company in which I'm the closest with my CEO um, and, you know, very actively engaged. Um, they, you know, another deal, it was fully remote, um, came in through a trusted source. Uh, similarly, you know, did a lot of work, did a lot of diligence many Zoom calls and, um, you know, I couldn't pack up and go to Singapore. And so, you know, it was, it was one of those things where, um, you know, and the credentials of the entrepreneurs also, um, you know, coming out of Stanford Biodesign, Y Combinator company, it was, it, it kind of gave me comfort, um, but actually ended up doing a lot more diligence, um, you know, relative to um, the, uh, you know, what I would normally do. And part of that was also because I think, there was a lot of opportunity, um, you know, to help them even through the diligence process and shaping their strategy and forming the strategy, which catalyzed, um, you know, closing out their round. And so, you know, and and that's that's been interesting. And you know, doing these Zoom calls, you know, early in the morning, late at night, um, I feel like we've we've definitely lost boundaries um, as a result of the pandemic. And so, kind of, um, you know, anything goes, but. Uh, it's, you know, I, I, I'm, that's something I'm looking for to maybe a little bit of return to normalcy and, um, you know, not taking calls at midnight, uh, but you know, it, it is what it is. Um, so 
Do either of you have any kind of cautionary tales from you know, companies that you looked into, but just something didn't seem right and couldn't um, you know, really go forward with it because of the interactions were just not at the same level? Nothing that comes to mind specifically. Uh, obviously, in time will tell, because we are, we've invested in this past year, and I, I don't think any of us have been lucky enough that we've had an exit that quickly or, or a failure that quickly. Uh, but you know, time will tell whether not having had, it's kind of like kids wearing masks now. What, what are the going to be long-term impact for them of the lack of socialization? What will that impact be on the decisions we've made, the investments we've made, where we did not have the tools, perhaps, um, uh, that we had prior to the COVID uh, uh, pandemic? Uh, and I think it's hard to say. Um, I think we've all tried to compensate for the lack of that. I mean, for me as an investor, particularly in med tech, um, not actually going to the facility, um, actually seeing what, what's happening, um, uh, the other employees that are involved, looking at the assembly lines, looking at the quality systems in reality. To me, that's bothersome to make an investment in a true med, med tech company without doing that. But we had to. And you know, time will tell whether, whether or not you know, that is a limitation. Uh, but no specific cautionary tale that uh, I think I can, I can point to at this point. I know, Omid, do you, what about you? I think. Um... And this this goes pandemic or not, you know. I think so the first interaction is always, you know, can you get the investor excited about you and your deal and the opportunity? Um, I think, you know, the the second and third meeting, you know, as you start really drilling down into the specifics of the opportunity and the challenges, you know, I, I've. I've been in conversations where really good first meeting, really bad second meeting, give them a third chance, again, bad. And, and some of it is you know, trying to sweep under the rug what the issues are, right? And avoid you know, the obvious glaring gaps in you know, whether it's regulatory strategy or clinical strategy or the data or the team. Um, and so I think you know, to me, the, the best thing to do is you know, be open and honest upfront know what your weaknesses are, know what you're missing. And often, if you are open and upfront about it, your investors will want to help you, right? And if it's not for them, they'll know somebody who may be interested. And I think that's um, you know, one thing that I always advise entrepreneurs is that you know, if you get a rejection right, for whatever reason, you should always ask you know, the investor sitting across from you, oh, well, who else do you know that might be interested? And because, you know, and as other panelists have said over this last couple of days, it's like you're going to kiss a lot of frogs until you meet your prince. And I think, the, you know, you could end up getting that warm introduction, right, from the person who didn't end up investing, but actually gets you in front of an investor that would do the deal. And so, I, you know, that's something that, um, and I, I've always tried, and, you know, I, I always try to reciprocate and say, look, this is why I can't do the deal or I won't do the deal or, you know, go do these things and come back, um, you know, because it's too risky for X, Y, and Z reason or, you know, it's not a fit right now um, because I'm just, you know, I'm inundated with so much other stuff. So, you know, it's, it's I think you should always ask, um, you know, if it's a no for now or a no forever and if it's a no, then, you know, where do you go? And, and I would add to that and I would say that, yes, you're going to kiss a lot of frogs. Um, I mean, the stats are it's somewhere between one to two percent of, of deals that that uh, uh, early stage investors see. Would they consider investing? Will they invest in, or perhaps lower than that? So you, it's a numbers game. But in order to make it less demoralizing, know the investors that you want. Uh, don't just you know throw it a, 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 a big net and hope that you're going to catch a fish. You really need to to swim in the right waters. Check out the website, you know, do some research, due diligence. Are these investors that would be interested? I can't, you know, tell you how many times, you know, it's very clear on our website, it's very clear with what we invest in that we don't do biotech. Yet, I can't tell you how many, you know, requests I get from biotech startups that they want us. And it's not that I don't think biotech is great. It's just we don't invest. That's not our space. We don't know that space. So I think it's very important uh, to number one, cast your net wide, but uh, cast it in the right waters. 
and build that, lay that pipe for the warm, we talked about this earlier, the warm introduction in <clears> order for it to be effective, but understanding that you're going to be meeting with, with dozens of investors until you get someone that might actually be interested in starting the due diligence process. Uh, along those lines, uh, I forgot to ask earlier, what's the typical size of your investments on the angel side? Okay, so I'm gonna specifically talk about that. So their angel groups vary, but in general, angel groups tend to invest um, at levels somewhere between uh, several hundred thousand dollars to one to two million. That would be typical for an, for an angel group. What has happened though, uh, since the angel ecosystem in the US has really developed over the last uh, decade or two, is there is now the opportunity to syndicate and there are organizations, including through the um, trade group, the ACA, which is you know, the equivalent in the angel group uh, to the NBCA. And, um, and that could raise significantly more amounts of money. But generally I would say, don't expect that, that angels are going to be able to lead a round that is greater than three or four million dollars. That would be at the high end, and they may not uh, actually invest all of that, but they could lead it significantly. And what we tend to do is we tend to do some syndication for some of the deals, but generally it's going to be in the several hundred thousand to one to two million. And how how many uh, investments do you look at at a time? Uh, you know, is it you know monthly because of uh, the cash flow or? Again, there's so many angel groups, but I would say the ones I'm involved with are fairly typical for organized groups. We see about 500 deals a year, so about 10 a week. We have a screening group, uh, and uh, one of the benefits of where we're located is we actually are close, to, we're in, in, in the Bay Area, we're in the South Bay, we're close to Stanford, we're close to the Biodesign Innovation Program, and we have about a dozen fellows no. that work with us, some of who are in the biodesign program or just finished it, and they want to get their investing chops, and they're part of the screening process. So being an angel investor is actually uh, you know, a volunteer job, if you will. Uh, so uh, many of us uh, that do that, uh, as our, that part of investing, don't have the, the time or the uh, bandwidth to be doing it full time. So having uh, fellows is very, very helpful. And I think most Organized angel groups do have um, that type of a, of a structure. Uh, the other group I'm involved with, Band of Angels, we also have uh, those type of individuals, not exactly the same because uh, it, it is a, a group that invests across um, uh, different uh, industries, not just simply life science. Uh, but so uh, uh, that's how we do that. And uh, it, the screening process involves uh, uh, going through the data and then making a decision whether or not a company should present to a committee that is focused on their industry. So we have two committees. We have a medical device digital health committee. We have a biotech committee. And depending on where the company falls, uh, if they made it through the initial screening process, they would then make their formal pitch to the committee. And that's a key step towards later potentially um, uh, being funded. Amit, how about yourself? Yeah, I mean, similar, um, anywhere from a few hundred thousand to like four or five million um, is our check size. Um, and, and it depends, I think, on both, you know, where kind of where the company is in development, what the risks are, um, what the upside is. Um, you know, I think, you know, similarly, it's, I probably look at, yeah, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 deals a year um, between conferences and you know introductions and you know what's interesting is sometimes I'll, I'll see you know a deal will be in my inbox maybe for a month or two and then I'll you know I'll be reintroduced to that somewhere else and I miss it the first time and I see it the second time and I start looking I'm like have I seen this company before and so you know it's and and so that's why early on you know um, my advice was you know keep trying and get a warm introduction because you know, it's it's all about timing. And I think the timing of when you meet an investor, how you meet an investor, um, and you know, what they're focused on, right? If they're deep in diligence on something else, it's really hard, you know, if you're <clears> under <throat> a term sheet, it's really hard to process another deal, whether it's, you know, angel investors, family offices, or even funds, um, you know, because typically it's kind of all hands on deck and get that done um, before you do much else. And so, you know, 
that's, you know, understanding that cycle, you know, you'll, you'll appreciate it as well as when you're going through a diligence process, you're getting all hands on deck and all attention. And, and I would add to that, persistence wins the day. And yes, you've got to have the goods. It has to resonate with the investor and you have to have good investor. We talk about product market fit. You have to have good investor uh, company fit. Uh, but persistence and that uh, ultimately should win the day. Uh, but uh, I think one should learn as an entrepreneur from the meetings that didn't go the way you wanted to. And so in addition to, I think we talked about it earlier, who else do you know that might be interested? I think if you understand uh, that you're not going to get an investment from an angel group or a family office, be very candid. Have an open, you know, non-confrontational discussion. What was it about uh, my presentation or the company you're not interested in? And if it's about the presentation, uh, we understand what, what you think I ought to do the next time around or how should I present it. So learn from all the negatives because you'll learn much more from those or the failed meetings than you will from some of the successful ones and use those to your advantage going forward with subsequent meetings I think can be very helpful. Great. Uh, one last question. Uh, it's kind of near and dear to me. What kind of IP protection do you expect early stage companies if, to have, if any? So that's a tough question. <laughs> no wonder you left it to the end. Uh, and there are many different answers. So I'll, I'll try to deal with it more at a high level. Clearly, IP is critically important at the early stages. It's one of the most important aspects of the value uh, of an early stage company. But it truly varies by industry. Yeah. IP on algorithms, AI algorithms, is a whole different kettle of fish yeah. um, than IP for a standard medical device. Similarly, it depends how crowded the space is. If you're in the mitral valve repair, transcatheter mitral valve repair space, you better get a freedom to operate. Yeah. Because it is so crowded and there is so much IP and so much crossover that company could have great, interesting technology. It is an important multi-billion dollar market. We've seen incredible exits in med tech. And you could have very experienced team members. But if they really haven't figured out, not just, and I think for a lot of founders, a lot of entrepreneurs, they don't clearly understand the nuance between I filed patents, I even have issued patents, that that has nothing to do with freedom to operate. Right. And they really need to understand that. Uh, it may be that having issued patents gives them some leverage with other entities in which there is uh, potential for infringement, but that's something they need to understand and deal with perhaps uh, at some point. But it really, again, it depends on, on whether it's um, a specific device, how crowded it is. Uh, so the, the simple answer is, uh, as an investor, one really needs to understand how important IP is, uh, where one should be looking for the kind of granularity of a freedom to, uh, to operate opinion, and it's expensive, and for early stage companies, I mean, I don't know, you know what your firm charges, but you know, it's gonna be certainly uh, something that would be a very significant expense for a very early stage company. Right. And sometimes an informal freedom to operate uh, done in a thoughtful way uh, can at least serve as a surrogate until a more formal one is needed somewhere later down the road. That's great, how about you, Hamid? Yeah, I would, I would say same thing, I mean, you know, if. Most of the time in early stage companies, you have provisional patents. And so there's always, you know, the, the risk that you're taking is that whatever your claims are will be narrowed um, unless you're really, you know, white field, brand new technology, never been done before. And so I, you know, I think it really depends case by case. And, um, you know, I, I always like to look at IP early on and then in more detail at the end of the diligence, um, just to really you know, get, get a professional opinion, because that's something where you know, it, it could make or break the company in the end from an FTO perspective. And, and I would add one more thing. We, we certainly feel about the importance of LP to uh, IP to create that moat. But there are other very important moats, particularly for an early stage company. And regulatory is for sure one of Absolutely. them. So a company's IP, for example, may not be as strong as you would like it to be, but this is going to be a PMA product and, and they're not gonna be subject to issues like infringement perhaps. Yeah. That regulatory path, the PMA could be more valuable yeah. than, the, than the actual IP. 
Similarly, or conversely, if a company is in a space that has a very low regulatory bar and, a ve and low bars to entry, it's, or is a digital health area or what have you, IP could be actually much more important there. And so one really needs to understand the relative value of the moats around the company. Great. Well, I think we've run out of time, but I do want to take questions. If there's anyone has a question, they could raise their hand. Yes, we have, do we have a microphone we can? <laughs> The, uh, Hi, my name is Patrick O'Donnell. I'm CEO of HD Life Sciences. And my question to you is I've had uh, a few um, firms or individuals reach out to me to, uh, that represent themselves uh, uh, to assist me in uh, uh, identifying capital. And um, or, or finders, but um, in some cases they're brokers, in some cases they're not. So my question to you is, um, do you have relationships with these different types of resources? Are they useful to CEOs like ourselves? And uh, any other um, suggestions or recommendations? So I'll, I'll, I'll start if you're right. So, um, so I think it's, it's if you think about securities law, right, being a finder, being a broker dealer, you know, depending on how the compensation is structured, um, could make or break you as a company. So if you, if an investor invests and you pay someone who's not a registered broker dealer, you know, theoretically that investor, if it goes south, you know, could sue the company and you know all its assets. So I, I think that's a big risk that the company ends up taking selling securities through an unregistered broker dealer. Now, there are many situations in which, you know, you have somebody who's well connected, you know, they know people. And so it's also how do you how do you structure the arrangement, right? Um, and if you bring them on as a consultant and they're on a monthly retainer and they're helping you with strategy and they're making introductions and that's it, and they're getting paid and compensated for their time, um, you know, then you you avoid that risk. And you know, I think they can be helpful. And it comes down to how much are you raising, right? How fast do you need the money? And what price are you willing to pay that finder, that consultant, that whatever to help you in that journey? Um, and you know, it comes back down to the warm introduction. Do they, do they really have the network to open doors for you? And then what is their role, right? Are they chief business officer or are they just a consultant or are they a banker? And I think based on, you know, if you're raising larger sums of money, um, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's helpful to have someone. Um, but often, you know, and we were always renegotiating these, but it's like, even if you have a banker involved, like investors don't want to pay the fees, right? Because that's coming out of their investment. And that's, you know, quarter million dollars, half a million dollars, million dollars less that goes to creating real value. And so it's a double-edged sword, um, but it's, you know, I don't know. So, I mean, at the risk of you know uh, being a little bit controversial on this, um, I'll answer it in a different way, less about the regulatory implications or concerns and what have you. It, it's I think that where you are as a company will dictate the caliber of the placement agents or the entities that are offering up to help you raise capital. And the truth is that I think for an, a very early stage company. Um, the entities that are involved there, not um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, in all cases, but if they're specifically there to raise capital, um, are not always that successful. Um, and I think that your ability to raise directly, if you're persistent, if you exhaust all the, uh, the uh, potential avenues where you can raise funding, whether it's angels, family offices. I think in the case of family offices, those type of entities can potentially be uh, helpful, but the cost and the price, in my opinion, and now I'm wearing actually an entrepreneur's hat, having done it for 25 years, raising over $100 million for the companies that I founded, uh, have found that in general, uh, at an early stage, you're not getting your money's worth and it's expensive. Now that's different for later stage companies. 
Uh, there, I think you have a different universe of bankers and other uh, uh, entities that will raise funding for you. And so if you're doing a Series C or a Series D and you're talking about raising 50, 100 million or more, uh, I think that that's a different, um, a different situation. And there, your due diligence really has to be about trying to work with the best uh, individuals or the best entities, their track records, trying to figure out how much it's going to cost you, both in terms of retainers, percentage of capital that's raised. Uh, but, but it's not a simple thing. And I would say that in the early stages, it's, it's, um, it's very spotty. Yeah, great. Uh, I think we need to wrap up. Um, there was one more question, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Hi, Tom Vogelsong with uh, Keto Technology and Life Science and Angel Investment Group. And question for both of you to compare and contrast uh, the, the sharing of best practices uh, like in the angel world, if you're collecting data from a company and every angel group comes in differently, is there any coordination? Uh, also on metrics on the back end, how I've, has an angel group done versus other angel groups, postmortems, things like that. In the family office world, my impression is it's a lot less coordinated and collaborative. And like you'd both comment on that. So I'll start with that. Tom, thank you. Very good question. So I think it, it is a bit of a wild, wild west in terms of you know how to understand the differences. But I will say that um, the Angel Cap Capital Association, ACA, is trying to bring some um, analytical information uh, to allow one to compare track records. But it is true that I think for most angel groups, not all, I think that uh, 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 the Texas Angel Network is a very good example of, of, of how they uh, keep uh, terrific data and, and, and are willing to share their, um, um, uh, their analysis of outcomes based on uh, different uh, parameters. But I think for most angel groups, it's a little bit of a, um, of a black box. And I think we do need a little bit more um, uh, clarity, uh, both from individual groups and, and cumulatively. Um, I can't really speak to, the, to how it is for family offices. My, my guess is that it's even more opaque. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's very rarely, you know, do do you talk about? Well, y you always hear about the winners, right? Where where people made money. You never hear about the losers. Um, and you know, I think from a metrics perspective, I mean, you know, like I, I keep track of all the companies I meet with, and um, you know, which ones I miss. You know, I go in a pitch book, you know, and and follow the tabs, and sometimes. A missed opportunity the first time around, you know, isn't necessarily a missed opportunity forever. Um, and you know, as you know, everything takes longer, costs more money. Um, so you know, sometimes you have a second bite at the apple. But I, I think, yeah, in the family office world, it's you hear about the winners, you never hear about the losers. Mm -hmm. Great. I'd like to thank the panelists and uh, thank Scott for for this opportunity. Thank you.